Okay, welcome. Um, we're going to start with this tutorial. It's a 3D a transient heat transfer problem. Hopefully, we can make it uh, until the end. So, uh, we're going to model a heating road. Basically, uh, we're going to use, um, we're going to start creating a part. This, uh, to create this part, uh, we are assumed that uh, it's, a, um, it's modeling in the space 3D, it's deformable, solid, and we're going to use the type sweep to, to create a part. Let's continue. The first, we're going to use um, create a circle through three points. The, diam the radius for this half circle is going to be uh, 0 0.0365 units. Um, then we're going to create these verticals. Once we finish the, the solid model, you will understand what I'm doing. So let's define the length for each of these verticals. Uh, the length is going to be 0 0.447 units for both. That's out of it. Okay. The next step is to proceed with the sweep path. So um, the sweep path, the cross section area for this um, hidden road, for this road, is going to be a circle. And the radius for this circle. The radius for this circle is going to be um, 6.5 10 to the minus 3. All right. So the next step is, is hit done, so we can swap the part. So here is the, the here is the the, the, the solid we are interested in. All right, so next step, um, since we're later for the mesh, we, uh, I'm going to part in half. We, I'm going to cut in half this, uh, this part just for purposes of the, of, of the meshing. So to conduct this, we are going to use a technique that is based in a datum plane. So we're going to create a datum plane it's going to be the x, y plane. Uh, the offset is zero. So this is basically the plane we're going to use to recreate the partition. The next step is create the partition. We're going to use the type cell, and we're going to use the datum, the, the, the datum plane as a state area. So we just need to select the data plane and create the partition. Um, and it's done. We're going to use later this partition. Let's move on to the, to the property module. Let's create a material, the, define the material properties. Density, 7,800 units. Since this is a thermal problem, we're going to define the conductivity. The conductivity is going to be 54 units. And also, we're going to define the specific heat. It's going to be 490 units. And I think I'm done with that. So the next step, um, the next step is um, we're going to create a section. 
the section is going to be, so, is going to be solid homogeneous, continue. The material is already selected. Let's assign the section. To assign the section, we need to select all the, model, the entire model and, se and select the section, which is section one. It's created, so we are done with this. Next step is we'll create an instance. This time we're going to create a dependent instance. So just OK. The instance should be created. Um, the next step is we're going to mesh the element. So go to mesh control. Since this is a dependent instance, we need to switch to part. Go to mesh control. Uh, yep, select the, the, the entire element part. We're going to use this algorithm medial axis. It's recommended for this type of problems, and that was the reason uh, I make a partition earlier in the part. So we're going to use medial axis as a coding, and we're going to use sweep as a technique to mesh. Let's go and select the element type. For the element type, we need to, we're going to select a linear geometric, and we're going to select heat transfer uh, for this purpose. OK. Um, yep. Since it's OK, this is the element type we're going to use. DC, DC 3D8 is an eight node linear heat transfer brick. So, what is next is we're going to define the size for the, um, the global size. Let's set up this as um, 0 0.0025. Let's apply to the entire um, part and let's proceed with the, with the mesh. So um, here's the mesh. Let me see if we can have a better view of the elements here. So one of the goals for, this cl for the class today is to, to provide uh, a procedure to parameterize this um, to parameterize the, the elements. So you guys don't need to deal with the creation of the shape functions for those very complex elements in shape, all right? So this is one of the goals for the, for the lecture today. So well, what is next? We already meshed the part. Um, let's create a step. So for the step, we're going to assume, we're going to set, a, a set um, an initial, um, sorry. Step, we're going to create a, a heat transfer step, which is the one that is changing in time. To do that, we need to go to, to, heat, to select heat transfer in this window, continue. We're going to set up a, all the steps for the incrementation application of the load. So, Let's say that we're going to study for 30 minutes the dissipation of the heat um, input in the bar. So let's say that for those 30 minutes are 800 seconds. Make sure that your response is transient. For the incrementation tab, we're going to set up at least a maximum number of increments of 1,000. Let's start with an initial size of increment of 1. Um, Let's set up this as, as a 0 0.01 for the, time, for the minimum. And the maximum is going to be 1,800. Um, this um, procedure requires for heat transfer to define a maximum temperature change per increment. So we're going to set up this as a 25 Celsius. Yes? So why is the maximum number of increments only 1,000? Excuse me? 
No, it's the, it's the, it's the, it's the maximum number, number of increments would you, you, uh, the software you're going to use to reach the, the, the solution. This is, this is what it is. OK. So once the step is created, um, we can move mm, to apply the load. So to create the load, uh, let's go to this predefined field manager. Let's create an initial condition for, for the problem, which is the temperature. So let's call this T naught and select the, the step um, initial. Make sure that the category is other such, so, such that you can select temperature. Um, we are the, 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 the room temperature is applied and, and over the entire body. So we need to select the entire body for this purpose, done. And we're going to set the temperature, the room temperature, as 23 Celsius. That's OK. Um, we're done with this step. Let's apply a load. So for the load, we're going to use the step we already defined earlier. Uh, we're going to uh, select it. category thermal is the only by default, is the only possible so selection. And we're going to apply the load to the surface. So the load um, is going to apply at the ends of the, of the roads. Over the, over the ends. So let's select this half, this other half, this half, and this other half. So this is where we're going to apply the, the heat flux. When it's done, what is left is just to define the magnitude. Uh, it's going to be 75,000 units. And you can see the, the load applied at that point. All right, so I think we're almost done. Let me see if I'm missing some step before I run the, the job. Um, yeah, I, I, I think um, we are almost done. So, yes. Where did you define the temperature? Where I define it? Yeah, where did you define it? To define the here in this in this um, icon, predefined field manager. Okay. So I think it's everything is correct. Let's try to run it. I feel I'm missing something, but I'm not sure what I'm missing. Let's see what uh, what the job says. So it's going to be um, job one, model one, continue. OK. Let's submit the job. The first step of the of the analysis was completely successfully. We're moving to the next step. Hopefully, we can make it before <laughs> my computer crash. It is completed. Let's move on to the results. Let's select uh, the temperature. Um, and hopefully we'll made it in time. So here is the the, propaga the, the propagation of the, the dissipation actually of the heat flux that we input in the at the ends of the of the, of the road. Uh, we are getting short of time, so uh, probably tomorrow, and I can go more in detail over this model in class. Okay, there are some 
features I, I would like to, to show you. So this is, now, this is all for now. Uh, hopefully, you, you like it. OK, thank you. Yeah, just in time. So the purpose of that uh, video presentation was to demonstrate that you have, you know, even in a 3D model, you could have elements of various sizes, shapes, and so forth. And uh, it will be very challenging for us to derive uh, shape functions for every single element and uh, formulate the, the, the element for each of those unique shapes. Uh, for that reason, we need to move to something more tractable, something that's more systematic, where we can now use a single element formulation for every single element, and that way we can uh, simplify the process that are used to, to solve the finite element equations. Uh, here we will be discussing the 2D finite element formulation, starting with isoparametric uh, formulations. Uh, so we went over this uh, last week, uh, but basically the steps are to develop the PDE of the problem, uh, come up with a strong form, uh, develop the weak form, and from there we'll discretize the domain, and then use the weak form to then um, develop the element formulation. So we'll use weak form Galerkin to do that. And then from there we'll assemble a system of the system together and then solve the nodal unknowns. So, so that was the basic uh, guideline. Uh, we also went through the uh, partial differential equation for 2D or 3D and uh, developed the weak form of the problem and we found that this was the weak form, weak form of the problem at the time when we did it uh, on the last lecture. And uh, in this domain, as you can see, uh, you can discretize it and have uh, 2D or 3T, sorry, 2D domains that could be quadrilaterals or um, trias, triangular elements. And uh, as you can see, every, the shape of every element here looks different. And it will be very challenging to come up with uh, an element formulation for each of those uh, in a unique way. Um, or it will take time, and it's not, it's not tractable. It's basically solving the problem for every single element again and again and again and again. The idea would be that we don't have to do that. Um, uh, just to remind you, the, the, uh, for triangular linear elements, the, the shape functions uh, look like this, and they look quite complicated. These were the coordinates of the vertices of that triangle. Uh, X and Y are uh, the spatial domain, what describes the spatial domain for that triangle. And uh, it also had an A there, which is the determinant of this uh, matrix right here. Uh, it's basically the area of the triangle. It is the area of the triangle. And you have to calculate this for every single element. On top of that, um, you will have to then not just have the shape functions, but have to use them uh, later on in the derivatives of those. And I'll show you what we got there. But for a quadrilateral element, it was even more complex. Uh, I showed you the simplification of, of a quadrilateral shape functions, uh, and I showed it to you for a simple rectangle. But what if you have a quadrilateral where none of the angles are 90 degrees? They're all... Um, you know, different angles. And so an example of that would be, for example, uh, that quadrilateral here. Uh, it's not a rectangular shape, and its shape functions will look quite complex. <clears throat> uh, we then went in and looked at the 2D finite element formulation, and for that we substituted uh, in the weak form of the problem, we applied weak form glurking and substituted the approximation function for temperature uh, substituted uh, for the weight function, selected the basis functions or the shape functions, um, and we substituted that in there and had to calculate uh, th this uh, equation here. And you can see I have gradients of n that I have to calculate now, and those gradients I'll have to calculate them for, for every single element, and they may look different. Uh, in fact, here's, uh, for example, for trias, triangular elements, I'll have to calculate the gradients in the shape functions a, a for every single element is different. So therefore, these derivatives will look different. It will be maybe complicated to, 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 to go through. And so it's not a really systematic approach. It's still a little bit uh, unique to every element. Um, 
we would like to get there. That's the goal. And then for quadrilateral element, very similar, um, but instead of three shape functions, we had four. And so everything, uh, basically it was the same formulation for both. It's just that one has an extra term, and that's because for a quadrilateral element, you have an additional unknown. Instead of three nodes, you have four nodes. Again, we're looking at temperature problems. Later on, when we look at displacements, Churchill problems, you will have more unknowns per node, of course, because now you have deflections um, in each of the three directions in 3D. Uh, so you have three nodal unknowns at each node. Uh, so things become more complex there, um, but the process is, is the same. Okay. Um, so as you can see here, the computational time to, to, to go through all of that can be quite extensive. And, uh, and our real goal is that it would be really nice if the shape functions were, were, the, were the same for every single element. And I can track the geometry with another parameter. And I can track it for every single element. And it's just a function of coordinates. I only have to do it once for every single element. But my shape functions and its derivatives are the same for every one. The integrals, as you can see, uh, if I were not to use the approach I'll be showing you today, it would be extremely dif difficult to calculate these integrals uh, over the area because the area is going to change whether it's a triangle or quadrilateral or it's a higher order element. It will become complex. And, I'm and what I'm trying to show you is that this approach is going to simplify all of that. It's going to make it beautiful, in essence, is what I call it. Uh, there's no better word to describe fine elements. Um, so let's look at a 2D linear uh, quadrilateral isoparametric element. Let's start with that one. I, I do think that you will have to use significant amount of your concentration to understand these concepts because there's a lot of things going on here that um, you're going to have to learn fairly quickly. Um, and so what I really want to do, I want to take a quadrilateral element of any shape and I want to turn it into a square. And I want that square to go from minus 1 to 1, minus 1 to 1. And the beauty of this is that all my integrals will be performed in this coordinate system. And if I can perform all my integrals in this coordinate system, uh, it's great because my integration scheme will be the same for everyone, for every single one of those elements. On top of that, the shape functions for these quadrilateral elements will be the same for every single element. And so all I have to do is really turn that quadrilateral and map it into a square. That's really the goal here. OK? So and, and, and to accomplish that, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to parameterize uh, the coordinates of that element. So I know the coordinates here at each of these corners, x1, y1, x2, y2, x3, y3, x4, y4. I'm going to take the coordinates within the element, which are given by x, y, and I'm going to basically map it into that shape using the interpolation functions. And so what I've done here is uh, we've already shown you that the quadrilateral em elements can be interpolated uh, as n1, n2, n3, n4 for quadrilateral four nodes uh, and then four temperatures. But if I, were to, if I were to use the same interpolation functions to um, parameterize x, uh, the location x within that element, um, and I were to also do the same for y, for the y direction, uh, if I were to use x and y, uh, and I were to use interpolation functions, uh, it would be great because now I can parameterize it and take it from one coordinate system to another. Uh, to show you that that actually works, uh, it suffices for me to show you an example. So, for example, uh, we know Kronecker delta property must be satisfied for one of these shift functions. And so if I say that at eta minus 1 and c minus 1, will everybody agree right now in this room that n1 at that node must be 1, right, because of Kronecker delta property? Will everybody agree that n2, n3, and n4 must be 0 uh, because we already talked about the shape functions belong to these nodes here. And uh, basically, these nodes are the shape functions at these locations are not active at node number 1. Okay? And so for that reason, you can imagine if I plug in here minus 1, minus 1, okay? minus 1, minus 1, what I get there is 1 there. 
0 there, 0 there, 0 there, and I'll have 1 times x1. You see what I'm saying? Didn't I just show you through this process that I went from this node and by plugging in minus 1, minus 1, by me plugging that value here, that x became x1. So I just showed you how, how I went from this node here, which I know its coordinates are x1. I just showed you that I can take it from x1 and I, put, I can put it in that corner. And I can repeat the process for every single one of those nodes. I can do it for x2, x3, and x4. And I can map it into that. And the same thing with y1, y2, y3, and y4. Remember, each of these corners are given by a pair of xi, y, yi. Okay? Uh, and if I can then parameterize it so that this node is going to that corner, this node goes to that corner, and so forth, then anything in between will also get parameterized into uh, somewhere in the center, right? So, somewhere in, this, in the area of that quadrilateral. Um, and so, 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 so let's talk about, so, so then it, it becomes important for me to explain to you um, how we get these shape functions. And to get these shape functions, we follow the same processes that we've discussed before. Um, if I have four nodal unknowns, uh, then I, know four, I need four interpolation functions. And so therefore, I basically have uh, A plus B, C plus C, eta plus D, C, eta. I, I, want to I, I want to get the shape functions in this coordinate system. That's really what I want to do. Okay? And so it should be relatively simple compared to what I did last week, or sorry, the previous lecture, where the shape functions look quite complex. I should be able to come up with very simple shape functions for this, for this particular shape. And uh, to, to accomplish that, we want to make sure we have uh, enough terms and correct number of terms. So I have four unknowns, so therefore I'll select these monomials here uh, in, in, my poly, in, in my approximation function. Uh, and then I really want to have a Kronecker delta uh, property and partition unity to be satisfied. I don't want to go and use these three terms and this term, or these three terms and that term, because then I'm biasing the solution in, in either C or eta. With that said, um, I can now derive the shape functions very, very quickly. I can just take my 1D shape functions and kind of construct them from there uh, by taking the product of one of the edges with another edge, and I can quickly just come up with them. We're doing no calculations whatsoever. And it may look like, well, is this really going to work? And the answer is yes, because if I plug in for C minus 1 and eta minus 1, what do I get? I get 4 divided by 4, 1. And very clearly, you can see here that this shape function is 1. Add node number 1. You can see the height there. I'm showing you for that. And I can almost show you almost very quickly that the shape function at n1, the node 1, is 0 at the other nodes. And that's easily shown here. If eta is 1 or c is 1, that goes to 0. Okay? It comes out automatically. All right? So combinations of this uh, will give you 0. And I can also show you for the rest of them that that's the case. So these shape functions, you can see how simple they look. Well, for the quadrilateral that we discussed earlier, they're quite complex, you know, and, and I just did an example for that one, but um, you can imagine. Another approach that's more systematic to, to come up with these shape functions is to basically take uh, the approximation function, plug in minus 1 minus 1, and then you should get t1. Plug in 1 minus 1, you should get t2. So I'm basically trying to evaluate that polynomial, uh, that approximation function in each of these corners, and uh, I will have four unknowns, okay, for A, B, C, D, and I have to write that in terms of the nodal unknowns, which are T1, T2, T3, T4. And when you do that, it, you will get that answer, the same answer I got before. So, so there is a systematic approach to get them, uh, and it, it will be very relatively straightforward to do that. Um, and so now I have my, my interpolation functions. Those are the ones that go here, N1, N2, N3, N4. And so if I use this same inter interpolation functions to describe the coordinate system x and y, then I've also accomplished not only interpolating the nodal, nodal unknowns, 
Now I have accomplished the fact that I can take a quadrilateral, apply this interpolation function, and suddenly I am in a rectangle, a square, I'm sorry. So, so, so it's, it's, you know, when, you, when I describe, there's a gentleman that came here last year with music, with a violin. I don't know if you agree, but maybe you don't agree. But finite elements is like music. Everything came together. Mathematicians were working in one corner. Some physician, physics guy was working in deriving the equation for heat transfer, mass diffusion, you name it. And then you have weak formula can be developed. And you have this approach of making things into regular shape squares for every single element. And they have engineers wanting to apply it in a practical manner. And all these things came as an orchestra together to form music, which is called fine elements. Okay? It's a truth. I, I don't know how else I will be able to solve an aircraft problem without fine elements in a simple way, in a way that makes sense, in a way that an engineer can use it. But it's based on all these concepts that were developed in many different uh, decades. And they all came together in a way that they work out in, in a way that's quite, quite uh, amazing to me. Uh, so, so, so now I, I can now go in and plug in my approximation function into my weak form Galerkin, you know, into my weak form. And if I follow the same steps, yeah, this is what I got before, and that has not changed. I, I need to put into this, in, into this weak form. That has not changed. But the thing that needs to be pointed out is that the derivatives of n are respect to x. And, and that has not changed to compared to what we discussed last lecture. The difference now is that these shape functions, do you see any x in there or y? No, now my shape functions are in a different coordinate system, which we'll call natural coordinate system. And they're c and eta's. So the n's don't have x and y. So how do I take these derivatives? How do I even do that? And so we need to figure that out. Not only that, we need to figure out how to turn this dA differential area into uh, using the natural coordinate system. And then we have to turn these integrals so they all go from minus 1 to 1. That would be really great if we can get there. So for that, that's not difficult. We want to just be able to do a change in variables, kind of what we did in calculus. If we do a change in variables, we can accomplish that. Those are easy. The ones that are hard to tackle are these guys. And so that's the ones we're going to have to discuss on how to, how to approach it. To approach that, and I think here's where you're going to have to really use concentration to really understand what I'm saying. And I think you can if you, if you follow my, my logic here, our logic here. So let's take one example. I want to take, and, and, and I have to perform this derivative for every single one of them. That, that's the difficult part. And so, so let's, let's focus on one of these. So instead of making it for each of these cases, I'll just take a generic i there. So this could be 1, 2, 3, 4. But I have to do that for every single one of them. Okay? So one of the derivatives I have to take is respect to x. Okay? But now I know that n only depends on c. And, and so for that reason, I have to use chain rule. And so, I'll use chain rule, so derivative of n respect to x, x derivative respect to c. So that's great. x and x cancels, and now I get that. But now, I also need to realize that n also depends on y, and y this depends on c. So I, I cannot stop there. I have to continue adding the contributions of y. So now I have derivative of n respect to y, y respect to c. Okay? And the neat thing about this, so this is the chain rule differentiation. Okay, that's that's what we get. That's for one term right here at the top. Actually, it, it does not belong to any term here. But but what we're really trying to do is to somehow come up with these terms to show up uh, in a way that I can use them. Okay. Now I do want to ask you a question. Do you agree that n depends on c and eta? Do you agree that I can do this calculation now? Yeah. The other question I have for you. Do you agree that x depends on c? Yeah, because I did. I chose x to be, in essence, if you recall, 
we chose X. So it depends on C and eta through this transformation here, this interpolation function. Okay? And because of that, I can perform that calculation successfully. I, I can determine that. Now, now uh, I don't want you to memorize what that looked like. I want you to just get a top level sense, big picture perspective, that, that you know that you can calculate it. Okay? So everybody here, I think, will agree with that. Uh, and then the, the rate of Y recept receptive C can also be calculated. So if I know this guy, I know this one, I know that one, perhaps I can, I can solve for these guys. Okay, but I don't have enough equations. I still have to do another derivative in order to get there. And so to do, do that, I'll take the derivative, partial derivative of ni respect to eta. And then here, again, I have to perform chain rule. So I have partial of ni respect to x, x respect to eta. And you can see x cancels out. You get that contribution of x plus the rate of a and i respect to y, y respect to eta. Again, y cancels out. You get the contribution of y. So you have the contribution of y. You have the contribution of x. And now, now the beauty of this is I know this. I know that. I know this. I know that. I know that. I know that. I don't know these two guys. Okay. But all I have to do, put it in matrix format, it becomes much more apparent what we need to do. So if I take the left side of the equation, put it into a vector, Okay, a column vector, and I and I realize that this can be can be put into a matrix format, and that in essence, this here is a repeat, and that's a repeat. I can put that in a column vector. In essence, if I multiply this row by that column, I get the first equation. If I take this column and multiply by this, if I take this row and multiply by this column, I get the second equation. Does everybody agree with what I'm showing you? Yeah? So I know this. I know this. I know this, 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 this. Because if I know the coordinates of the, of the element, if I know the coordinates of the element, I know this. I know this. I know this. I know this. It is a function of C and eta, sure. But you know it in terms of that. And likewise with these shape functions. This is what we couldn't quite calculate before. It was difficult for us to do that because there were a function of C and eta, and, 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 and I had to take the derivative with respect to x. So, so I've done it indirectly, and now I can, I, I, I can uh, invert this uh, matrix to the other side to really get this matrix right here. And um, this matrix right here is a very important matrix. It's called the Jacobian of the element. And the Jacobian of the element is the one parameter and the only parameter, actually, that contains the element informa information. Okay? Um, and so that is the element that's going to contain the brain of the element. That element knows if that element looks like a quadrilateral, parallelogram. Hopefully I said that correctly. Uh, it will tell you what shape does it look like, trapezoid, maybe. Or that Jacobian knows that information, right? And and uh, I think it's apparent because this is the only thing that has element geometry information, right? So let me take you back to what x and y look like. So uh, do you know the coordinates of every? Do you know the coordinates of every vertice? Right? I know x one y1. I know x2, y2. I know x3, y3. I know x4, y4. I know this column for every element. I know the shape functions. I came up with them, and they look the same for every element. So performing this derivative is not hard. And I want you to notice I made it m bold x. I'm calling this m bold in this column ve vector x. This x bold is fully known. I call this m bold and y column here, this y ball is fully known. n is known, y ball is known. n ball is known, x ball is known. n ball is known, but t ball is not known. That's what we're trying to solve for, the temperatures of the knowns. Okay? So let's go back to where we are at. Well, let me give you the big picture perspective again. What we're trying to do is calculate b 
but B is gradient of N, but N is a function of C and A. So that's, we're trying to figure out how to calculate those, and, and that is the goal here. Uh, so now that, that I have a way, what I can do is I can invert the Jacobian. And so invert the Jacob this matrix here, uh, don't get hung up with words that sound complex. It's just the word that we give this matrix. It's called Jacobian. So invert that. And if I invert that, now I have an expression for these derivatives uh, for i equals 1 through 4. I can get them, uh, and it will, be, it will look like that. Okay? And so that will be basically j. Let's call this j. So j inverse times this column vector. Uh, and I know them for every single one of the shape functions. I can calculate that a ahead of time. Do you agree I can know? Do you agree I can do that for? Say you don't like it because you only run your own code. Don't recommend doing that. I can calculate ni, derivative of c, derivative of ni respect to eta, way in advance, before the problem starts. Right? It's the same for every single element. The only thing that's going to change is this Jacobian. And that's not a very difficult calculation. Now. I want to point something out, which our colleagues in the back can confirm with me if it's true or not. But if you have a highly distorted element, an element that's not, a ver I'll call it not very good quality, uh, what's going to happen is that the inversion of, inversion of this Jacobian is, is going to be hard to do. Okay? It's going to give you some problems numerically. If, if the, if the, if the, the, let's say instead of a square, is highly distorted to the point that every the angles are say 160 degrees, a very obtuse angle, and very acute angle. If you're to calculate that Jacobian, it's going to become um, you can do it, and when you invert it, you're going to have some problems numerically, and it's going to show up in the finite element calculations. I don't know what software you use, colleagues in the back, but um, I'm pretty sure you have to do a Jacobian check to make sure the elements are of good quality and you can use them. And that's why. That's the reason why you want to do that. A poor element is one that has a, a bad Jacobian, a, a one that you cannot invert very well. Um, that also is going to affect the numerical integration scheme in many different ways. Just because you get numbers that are so small? Yeah, absolutely. So the numbers you get are, are extremely small, and then you will have some issues, or, or large extremely large. You can go either way. Um, so now I'm ready, by the way, to, I'm not too far from done, by the way. <laughs> okay? It will take me five days, maybe, to solve a problem without a superimetric formulation. It will take me about an hour to this, do the same problem with a superimetric formulation. And I'll prove that to you, because I'm going to show you an example, and I'll compare it to Atticus. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm ready. This is my Jacobian for every element. This is the shape functions as a function of um, C and eta, and I can take that derivative in advance. This is one, what I'm trying to calculate. So I have G inverse times that. And now what I want to point out here is that I want to point out here that this right here, is for i equals 1. This right here is for i equals 2. This right here is for i equals 3. And then this right here is for i equals 4. Can you now see with me that perhaps I can just replace this column with this column, but then I just have an extra j inverse kind of on my way? You see that? So this column can be replaced with that, OK? But then I have this j inverse. Uh, in each of those coefficients. you agree? So why not just put the j inverse ahead of that, and now I'm ready to go. So that's my b bold. So the j inverse right here, and then I have my columns uh, right there. Okay. Do you guys follow what I've done? Is it visually clear? Do you have a question? It's by J is a two by two. Two by two. So this is two by two. This is two by four. 
So then I get a 2 by 4, which is excellent. That's what I want. Okay, excellent question. Thank you for asking that. Uh, the Jacobian will be 2 by 2 in a 2D, uh, uh, in a 2D plane. It will be 3 by 3 in a 3D model. Just imagine how difficult it would be for me to solve a, a hex element with six faces. And none of the angles are 90 degrees, right? But the Jacobian makes everything into a nice cube. So in that case, the Jacobian will be 3 by 3. Yeah? Excellent. So I'm ready. I'm ready. I have B ball now in the, in the way I needed it. And I'm ready to substitute it into my, um, into my uh, weak form. So this is element unique to remind you. This is the same for every element. The shape functions are known. I know the shape functions. So I can calculate the derivatives ahead of time. I can do that. Um, the Jacobian needs to be calculated for every element. But it's going to become very exciting because I'm going to show you how to do that Jacobian calculation. And it's going to become clear that it's even easier than I have explained to you so far. So let's look at the Jacobian calculation, which needs to be done for every element. So this is uh, what well, I need to calculate derivatives. And so that is x right there uh, with a column vector of knowns. I know the, the, the locations of that quadrilateral uh, vertices. This is n bold. And I'll call this column x bold. x bold is known. n bold is known. You know the shape function. So you know uh, x. And so the root of x respect to c is basically the root of n bold respect to c. You agree? And then I just have x bold right there. That's it. That's all I have to do. Then I also need to calculate the derivative of x with respect to eta. And so that's just derivative of x with respect to eta equals derivative of n bold with respect to eta x bold. In essence, just to expand it for you, I have the derivative of n1 with respect to eta, derivative of n2 with respect to eta, derivative of n3 with respect to eta, and so forth. I have to do the same thing for y, and I provide that to you here. So therefore, I know how to calculate each of these components in here. And uh, in essence, I've substituted it here uh, for an expression that, that, that you will understand. So, so, so I've taken each of these calculations and put them here. Okay? That needs to be calculated for every single element. And later, in very few minutes, I'm going to show you how that this is going to simplify even further to the point that it looks like just like b-bold. The b-bold we calculated is going to look like that. I'll show you that. Okay. Any questions at this point in time? Do you agree that I can get the Jacobian for every element? If I know the coordinates, I know the shape functions, then these derivatives are trivial to calculate. Yeah, they may be a function of C and eta. They may be, sure, but they are just a function of C and eta. That's it. Okay. Um, all right. There's a question. Yes. Yes. This derivative here yeah. and this derivative here will be the same. And, and I'm going to talk about that. This derivative here and this derivative here is the same. And I'll talk about that. That's how it's going, we're going to get and simplify it more even. OK? In fact, you can probably see already what I'm going to do. But. OK. Um, excellent. Excellent. I don't know. I, I, every time I, I teach this, it's exciting to me because I'm solving a very complicated problem and making it easier to do, okay, to solve. Um, do I want to do it by hand for the rest of my life? No. I just did it once maybe so many years ago. I don't want to do that again by hand. That's what you'll be doing by hand. Good news, though. You do it once, and you probably don't have to do it again. Okay. Unless you're doing research. I did, I did it for my research also. I had to develop my, I developed a, a new element. Uh, I wanted to, you know, get a PhD, so I did my research, right, to do that. Uh, but once you did that, you don't have to do it again, right? 
You can just use abacus. And hopefully you know what abacus or nastran or ansys is doing internally in the code. Uh, moving forward here, so I'm primed. I'm primed to move forward. B bull, I know how to deal with that. D bull, I know it fully. That's the condu conductivity matrix. H is the plate thickness. So I'm, I'm basically ready. M bull, I know the shape functions. It's a changing variable at this point. Um, VA is the only thing here that I need to tackle. I don't know how to how quite tackle it. So, but the bottom line is that DA is just a determinant of J, deep C D eta. That's it. And uh, you know J, don't you? The, the, you know the matrix J? Then I know the determinant. And I, I provided the proof of, of that formula uh, here. Uh, I don't want to go through that in extensive detail, but I'll give you the overall outline. If I took a differential element here and crossed it with dB, uh, I know the vectors. Uh, so then if you go through that process and you get the cross product, don't you agree that cross product of two vectors gives you the area? So if you follow, you can do this at home. I don't want to cover it here. But I gave you the proof if you wanted to look at, it, at that. And what you find at the end is that that's a determinant of J, right there. You can see that there. Just visually, just look at that. It looks exactly like the, de 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 the determinant of J. Okay. Um, any questions? We're getting close. We're getting close. Because I'm there already. I'm <laughs> just showing you. Okay, so, so for B bold, I'm going to replace it with J inverse. And I'm going to call this B bold N. And I'm going to do that so I don't have to type all of that into my matrix and it's a big, it doesn't fit in PowerPoint. Um, and so, again, B bold here needed to be calculated. And B bold was in a way that I could not do it before, but now I can. And it's J inverse, which is element unique, times this, which is the same. This B bold N is the same for every single element, every single one of them. So now I'm ready to plug it in here to my my weak, uh, sorry my element formulation, the general way of doing it uh, for general quadrilateral. And I, what I get here is for B bold, I have J inverse B bold N. D uh, is just that right there, okay? Nothing there, unique. J inverse B bold N. And then for DA, I'm going to replace it with the determinant of J, deep C D eta, and then uh, the rest is fairly simple. And then everything goes from minus 1 to 1, minus 1 to 1. Rho C, and then, again, these terms right here, um, all I'm doing is plugging in the interpolation functions, the new ones, the changing variables. Okay? I'll let you look at that carefully a few more minutes. Normally, I'll write these things in a, ch in, in a chalkboard, and it takes me about 20 minutes to do that. And so, because we're not doing that, and I want to give you an opportunity to really absorb this, so, so make sure you understand it, ask any questions. The, the H is the thickness of the plate. So can you take a note for me? We're missing an H right here, the thickness of the plate. Thank you. Yeah, we'll talk about that term. I'll, I'm going to talk about that term very, in few, very few minutes. That's the toughest term to deal with, and it's, it's very complex to deal with. And I, I need to really, we'll spend some time on that one, OK? In fact, everything we covered so far is relatively quick and easy. Uh, the hard part is the boundary terms. Uh, in, in the book that I gave you, my book, uh, which was available made for free to you, and
So with that said, if you go to the book, there are calculations that are being performed there. And, and I show you with various examples, we go through in quite detail on how to deal with that last term. And that last term is a surface, is a surface integral, remember? The boundary term. Mm -hmm. And the reason that's a little bit difficult, I'll be covering in a few minutes. It, it's not difficult, it's challenging to kind of absorb. And I want to make sure you guys get that, because you will have to do, apply this in the final exam. Uh, and so we've, we've, we're able, we were able to deal with all these integrals, and they'll go from minus 1 to 1. Very nice, guys. Very, this, this is great. I know everything here. I know b bold in ahead of time. I know j inverse for every single element. I know d bold, I know the conductivity of the material. I know the thickness of the plate, I know j bold for every single element, so I know the, the, the determinant. I can perform this numerical integration now, and I'll show you that how to do that. I know the density for, if I want to include transient, I know the density, I know the specific heat, I know the shape functions for every element because they're the same for all of them, I don't have to calculate them. I'm, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to, to deliver the results. This this DA is the differential element of the domain. Remember, we have a, a 2D domain, right? The differential element is, is your differential element, element for, for performing that numerical integration over the domain. In this case, since we're looking at the element formulation, the domain is the element, right? And so dA is dx dy. So, so let me go back to make sure you follow that. So here, uh, dA is dx dy. That's basically a little square here, d, dx dy. And I'm, I'm trying to integrate this over that domain, which is over this domain. That, as you can see, it's not easy to do that integration, right? But I'm turning this dx dy into the terminal of j, dip c d eta, and now that's easy to integrate. I mean, that's minus one to one, right? Yeah? Okay. Um, with that said, um, we're almost ready. Almost ready. I want to show a few more things here. I just took copy and paste from the previous picture and put it here. And, uh, um, I want to point a few things out. So I, I took the derivatives of these guys. I didn't have to do that, but I wanted to show you how, how, how nice it looks. Well, I don't know if you call this nice, but it's, isn't this more visually appealing than the one on the left? I mean, we took the derivatives, and there's four of them, and they all look quite simple. Okay. The other thing I want to point out that's actually quite interesting is that's my Jacobian right here. And I want you to realize here that this derivative of n bold c, derivative of n bold c, isn't this here? Just forget about this x for a second. Isn't this here just basically this, guys, right there? Can you visualize that mentally? Just map it out? Let me show you. The root of n bold c is basically that row. And the root of n bold eta is that row, isn't it? So isn't, isn't this, apart from this x, isn't this column here just basically this whole thing? Let's call that bn bold. So that's bn bold, x bold. So that's bn bold and then x bold. This right here is a 2 by 4 matrix, which is this here, this here right here. And x bold is fully known. I know that one because that's a, that's a coordinate, the vertex coordinates, and there's fully known. Those are numbers, right? I can also repeat the process and notice here that this column here is basically a 2 by 4. And again, that's b bold n, y bold, OK? It's a 2 by 4, 4 by 1. So what I get here is a 2 by 1. Here I get a 2 by 1. So that I, in total, I get 2 by 2. In fact, I can factor a b and bold now very nicely. Can you see now that this is a 2 by 4 still? This is a 1 by 
a 4 by 1, a 4 by 1. So basically, I have a 4 by 2, and I get a 2 by 2, basically. But this is what's very neat. I only had to calculate b in bold once. And just knowing b in bold once, I plug it in here. I plug it in there. I only had to calculate b in bold once. And all I have is a matrix of, on, uh, of known values. These are vertices. Isn't this the pair of coordinates of that vertices? Is x1, y1, x2, y2, x3, y3, x4, y4. Is a pair of that quadrilateral. I fully know the, the corners of that triangle. And if I multiply that by b in bold, I get the Jacobian. OK? I know the conductivity matrix, and I know the shape functions. OK? Any questions? Any questions? Are you ready for the challenge? Let's talk about that challenge. And that challenge is this, this term right here. Why is it so difficult to deal with that term? Okay. Let me call it challenging. Nothing is difficult for you guys. Challenge is something where it looks difficult, but you can, you can, you can make it work. And I think you can make it work. So let's look at a scenario where I have a quadrilateral, but I want to apply a heat flux in this edge. The problem is that I'm applying a heat flux to the edge, but it maps to this edge here, right? And so that's what makes it complicated to deal with this term, because this term is a boundary term. Remember we talked about that? That's a term that talks about a line integral that bounds the domain of interest. Um, and so if I'm applying in that boundary any heat flux condition and I prescribe it in any of these edges, I have to map it to this coordinate system and perform the calculations in this coordinate system. And so that's why it becomes a little bit tricky. And so, but if you follow what I'm going to explain to you, I think you'll do fine. Just pay attention to what I'm doing. So what I'm going to do here, I'm going to call this heat flux to be P. Just call it 2 watts watts per meter square just make it a number i called it p here just for simplicity i didn't want to carry this bar basically the plate thickness is h you know that one just just make it one i don't care um so do you do you know the shape functions yeah so for that one it's a change of variables just make it a change of variables it's just it's just in bold transpose here in bold transpose with the shape functions in the system that I don't want to really know about because it's too difficult. The shape functions in that quadrilateral are extreme. The, the shape functions in this system are extremely complex. So I don't, I don't want to deal with that. I want to change variables to that one. And so from that perspective, these shape functions just become the ones that we talked about. The second thing here that I want to pay attention to is that if I take a differential element here, I want you to follow me here. Let's call this differential element here ds, which is this ds right here. Uh, I can map, if I map it, it becomes d eta. You see that? That's d eta because that's the one that we're talking about for differential element. And you agree that this is being evaluated. We're really looking at this at c equals 1. Right? We're looking at that edge, which is c equals 1, and d eta is the differential element that we need to consider. Is that true? Yeah? Everybody follows what I just said. I'll repeat one more time, but this edge, which is number two, three, and if, 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 if the number, if I had applied the loading here, three, four, then it will map to this edge, right? But, I, but I'm mapping it. I'm basically applying loading to this edge, two, three, so it's, that's why it's going to that edge. How I differentiate between this edge and that edge? How do I differentiate that? Well, C tells me that. C at 1, right, is at that edge. You agree? And so I have to perform this line integration. And this d eta is really what we're going to use as a differential element. So if I, know, if I go now and were to look at this, ds, I'm going to turn into d eta. Okay? 
But you see a square root here, and that's the derivative of x respect to eta squared plus the derivative of y respect to eta squared. That's important because that is how you convert this ds into uh, this uh, formula times the eta. Okay, this is basically a line differential length, if you remember from school. Okay. So you can see another way to look at it, you agree that d eta cancels, and you get dx squared plus dy squared square root of that. Isn't that basically ds? Yeah? There's w different ways to look at this. Okay. Now, I have to evaluate all of this at c equals 1, because I'm looking at this edge here. Okay. I may have to have additional terms. I may have to add another one minus another one, minus another one, if I have heat fluxes applied to other edges. Then I have to include that additional terms as necessary. Okay? I'll show you how Abacus is doing it. Once you learn what, what, how you do it by hand, I'll show you what, how you specify that in Abacus, how Abacus knows you're applying a heat flux there. But Abacus is doing the exact same steps we're talking about here. Uh, it may not be apparent to you, but this derivative is actually quite simple to calculate. Um, this dx d eta, uh, dy d eta, you can calculate the derivative. You know x, don't you agree that you know x as a function of shape functions times a column vector of x, right? And so that derivative is easy to calculate. And then it simplifies further when you make c equals 1. It just becomes really quick and easy to see, okay? Um, I don't know if I want to do that now to show you that because I did not prepare a slide on that. Um, but perhaps we could try to do a mental exercise on how does it look. You want to try it? Let's try it. You never know. If, if you can follow me on this one, kudos to you, but I'm going to give it a chance. Right, right. Why not deep C, right? Because this map to this edge. And so I'm integrating only along that line, that line is along eta. Along this line, C is constant, right? C is 1. So you only, your differential element is the eta. That's what you have to integrate, yeah? So P is a heat flux here. Yeah, so yeah, it, it just goes along. Yeah, right. When I when I discuss when I discuss uh, solid mechanics problems, uh, I'll explain there what happens. But for heat flux, you you, you know, you're applying heat flux normal to the surface, so it, it stays with it. It's, it's mapping. That, that's what mapping means. You're mapping it from this coordinate system to that one. It will be the same magnitude, it will be uniform, correct. So let's do a mental exercise because I think you guys know what's going to happen. I really do. Does it work even with a curved surface? Oh, I, I, curved surface? yeah, very nice, very nice question. So, so beautiful. <laughs> yes. So I can have a quadrilateral, second order quadrilateral, which I'll be discussing. And one of the edges can be completely curved. And I'm applying heat flux along that curve. And when I do this calculation, it turns into a straight line with that calculation. Sorry? Let me, when, I'll explain when I get to the, um, when I discuss the higher order elements. Okay, I'll, I'll if I don't re remind. Okay, so let's do a mental exercise. I think it's wor worth it. Uh, I want to show you that, that quickly, what it quickly simplifies to. So let's take derivative of x respect to eta. I'm going to try. I don't know if I can do it easily. Um, derivative of x respect to eta. Okay, I can do it. Okay, Der derivative of x respect to eta. Remember x was the n1, n2, n3, n4, and the column vector was x. Remember that? So... Derivative of n respect to eta is basically the derivative of n1 respect to eta, right? Derivative of n2 respect to eta, derivative of n3 respect to eta, 
derivative in four respect to eta, right? Isn't that the bottom row there? So I have that, you see? Okay. And then x, and then x, so this derivative here, respect to eta, has to be calculated. So you get this row, which already is the derivative of n respect to x, times the column vector of x1, x2, x3, x4, right? That's what I have. Since I already calculated the derivative, I'll evaluate this at c equals 1. So let's do that. When I put 1 here, what do I get? 0. Here, what do I get? Minus 1 half. Here, what do I get? 1 half. Here, what do I get? 0. So I get 0 minus 1 half, 1 half, 0 times a column vector of x1, x2, x3, x4. So what I'll get is x1 times 0, that's 0, x2 times this one, which is 1 half minus 1 half, x3 times 1 half, and then x4 times 0. So what I'll get is x3 minus x2 divided by 2. Everybody agrees? And if you don't follow it, I want you to do it at home, because I think you'll get it. So x3 minus x2 divided by 2. Okay. That's what I get for that. If I repeat it for y, I don't almost have to do it because it's going to be the same. I don't have to do it. It's going to be the same. y3 minus y2 divided by 2. So this is interesting. I just have x3 minus x2 squared, y3 minus y2 squared, and if I take the 2 out out of this square root, I get 1 half of square root of x3 minus x2 squared plus y3 minus y2 squared. What is that? That's the distance between these two points. Let's go back. Let's go back to your 1D fine elements. Wasn't the Jacobian the length divided by 2? Try to remember. For 1D elements, the Jacobian was for linear elements was L the length of the element divided by 2, wasn't it? Isn't that what we're getting here? We're getting this distance here, the length of the edge, divided by 2. And it's integrated from minus 1 to 1. It's a linear element. When it becomes quadratic, then if the node is in the center of the element, you'll, you'll still get L divided by 2. But if the node is off-center, then it's, it's not going to be that simple as I'm showing you here, of course. OK, I don't know if you followed that. If you didn't, please go home and derive it. And you'll see it's going to work out really nicely, and you'll follow it. it. It just takes a couple of minutes of your time just to do it. OK? All right, so I'm ready now. That was it. That's all you have to do with the boundary term. Uh, and so now I'm ready to discuss numerical integration. How we integrate a domain. So for 1D domain, I already covered that. I take phi, which is, is inside the integral from minus 1 to 1, and I evaluate phi at these quadrature points multiplied by this. I, I'm very, very fearful of using weight functions because you're going to think these are the other weight functions. Let's call them, um, can somebody help me? Different words. Just give me a different word. Thank you, man. Gauss weights, OK? Um, and so the table is given here on how to do that. And we demonstrated that we can get very good accuracy uh, to a polynomial. You know, you can basically integrate these exactly to a particular a polynomial degree. You know, we, we went through that. Um, but for 2D, how to deal with a 2D integration is actually quite simple. Uh, if I have. Uh, Integration from minus 1 to 1, minus 1 to 1. All you have to do is evaluate. So, so for one point, it's easy. Just take phi, this, whatever is inside this deep C d eta, just this thing inside. Evaluate it at the center. That's a one-point integration. And that one-point integration will have a weight of 4. And it will be evaluated right at the center, which is 0, 0. If you do that, you integrate it from minus 1 to 1, minus 1 to 1. You already did that integration. Okay. Um, and, and so all you have to do is take 4 times phi evaluated at 0, 0, 
and you're done. That's your that's the calculation of the integral. Okay, that's it. Uh, very simple. That can integrate exactly a linear quadrilateral element. Uh, typically, uh, simple in shape. You can do a really good job. Let's look for this two-point quadrature. Two-point quadrature. Uh, basically, the weights are W. Can you help me to fix this? WI. I suppose to say WI equals WJ equals one. Uh, so the weights are one, each of them. Uh, so if you if you value the the integral inside the phi, phi at each of these coordinates, how many of them you have? Pairs. Four. One here. One here. One here. One here. And uh, if you evaluated it, um, and you multiply by the weight functions of one, you get the integral from minus one to one, minus one to one. That's four terms. Four terms. And there are just combinations of this plus minus one squared over three. Forget about the weight, the Gauss weights because they're all one anyway. So it's just phi at those points and just add them up. That's your integral. Isn't that cool? How easy is that integration? Yeah. This this only works for an inter integral, but it's fine because we made our integral go to minus one to one. That was the purpose, right? Okay. Excellent. Let's, uh, I hope you had moments of excitement during, during that time. If you didn't, uh, come talk to me because I'll make sure you get excited about it. Uh, let's look at second, uh, uh, sorry, um, 2D linear triangular elements. So I covered uh, 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 quadrilateral elements. Let's cover a triangular element now. Same process. Very similar process. I'll go a little bit faster now. Um, same thing. We're trying to discretize. This, this was our general element formulation. I want to turn this into a, as a parametric formulation. And so I have to convert all these integrals into uh, easy ways for me to integrate the domain. And not just that, these b's need to be evaluated. Okay? Uh, this one is actually a little bit easier in some ways. So the actual uh, triangle looks like this. I want to go, the shape that's typically selected is called the RNS system, RNS. And it's a, re, a, a triangular shape like that with a side of number of one unit and a side of one unit. And typically, uh, the first node number that's selected here is one in the uh, right hand, so the right side triangle. Uh, and then the other vertices take two and three. Okay, that's the numbering uh, convention. Uh, and so I can take any triangle. The idea is to take any triangle and turn it into that. That's the idea. Um, you, you can uh, I'll come up with your own. So you can you can say, okay, I don't like this approach. Maybe for my work research work, I'm going to choose a equilateral triangle. I could map any triangle to that shape. I could do that. But this is the standard shape. We call this a tri standard triangular shape. It's ST, the standard triangular shape. And it's in the RNS coordinate system, RNS, with a value of one on one edge, one in the other edge. Same thing, but now one less term, right? Because now we have three vertices. So shape functions we need to come up with. We'll parameterize X and Y. But now instead of C and A, I'm using RS to be consistent to what books use. And then temperature is also interpolated with the same shape, shape functions. And the fact that I'm using the shape, same shape functions makes it isoparametric. That's what isoparametric means. Uh, I'm ready to, to begin. Uh, this is my, uh, my triangular element now that I'm going to work with because I turned every triangle into a standard triangle. And this is a triangle that will be uh, performing the numerical integrations. And so if I have three vertices, three unknowns, then I have three terms, A plus B, R plus C, S. This one is quite simple to derive the shape functions. I show you. Uh, so we'll include these three terms right here. Okay. We'll do that for a triangular element. This one is really easy to do by hand. And I did it by hand because of that. So T, R, S is A plus B, R plus C, S. T as 0, 0 is A plus 0, T1. So I get the value of A as T1. T at 1, 0, so at this node here, uh, is T2. So I get A plus B plus C times 0. 
and I get a plus b is equal to t2. And then t at 0 comma 1 is a plus 0 plus c, then I get t3 as a plus c. I can solve for c and b very quickly. So this is one of the few scenarios we can actually do it really quickly by hand. So if I know a and it's t1, I can get um, this very quickly. So a plus br plus cs is t1, and I can substitute what b is, which is t2 minus t1. I can substitute what uh, c is, which is t3 minus t1. I can factor out t1. If I factor t1 out, I get 1 minus r minus s plus t2 times r plus t3 times s. And so these are the shape functions right here. s is n3, r is n2, 1 minus r minus s is n1. Isn't that cool? The shape functions look simple. Yeah? You want to see if it works? Let's try partition unity. Can I add s plus r plus 1 minus r minus s and get 1? Excellent. Do I have Kronecker delta properties? So I put 1 minus r minus s. I put r and s to be 0 here, so I get 1. Works. Make uh, r equals 1, s equals 0 for this one. What do I get? 0. So Kronecker delta property satisfied. And if I try it again, I get 0 there. I don't want to even do this. It's just obvious that it works. You can try this one almost by just looking at it. <laughs> OK? Isn't that cool? Simple shape functions. So n1 is 1 minus r minus s. R, uh, n2 is r. n3 is s. I'm ready to go. Now these derivatives need to be taken care of. I can't do it because they're a function of x, not they're a function of r and s, not a function of x. So I have to do that calculation somehow. So uh, same process. Uh, I take a uh, chain rule, okay? Chain rule at the bottom there to calculate these derivatives. Don't want to bore you, so I'm going to skip some steps here. Um, I have to calculate the Jacobian, okay? I have to solve for this column vector because that's what I want to find here for each of the x's. Sorry, for each of the i's, 1, 2, and 3. Uh, I do that. Uh, um, I invert the Jacobian, and then I'm ready to find uh, the these columns of uh, ve uh, vectors. Okay. I'm just repeating everything I did before, but with a triangular element. Anybody wants me to go over this a little bit slower, or you want me to just continue? Keep doing it. Keep going. Anybody opposed to that? You want me to repeat it a little bit? One more time. Same process. OK. You guys are sharp. Uh, yeah. I'm ready to calculate this. And um, so B bold is this. I need to plug in this. I want to replace this to something I can calculate derivatives on. So this is that for element one, uh, shape function one, for two is that, for shape function three is that. So I'm going to plug this in here for that, plug this in here for that, plug this in here for that, but J inverse is common to all of them. Factor it out, you get J inverse. And then you're left with the columns of uh, derivatives of shape functions with respect to R and, and so forth. Any questions on that? No? No questions. Excellent. OK. You agree these derivatives are, you can do it by memory? Let's just do it just for fun. Isn't shape function 1, 1 minus r minus s? What is that derivative? Minus 1. Let's do the next one. 1. This one. 0. This one. Minus 1. This one. 0. This one. 1. Bam. Done. Element unique, same for every element. You guys just did it with me really quick. We got minus 1, 1, 0, minus 1, 0, 1. Same process here to get the Jacobian as what we did before. Uh, can somebody, can, can somebody,
Um, any questions? Any questions? Simple, right? Really simple. And I can go on here and same uh, using the same logic. DA is just DA determinant of J D R D S. Same process. And uh, again, now I'm ready to turn this in my line integrals. But my integrals now look a little bit different from before. They don't go from minus 1 to 1, from minus 1 to 1. They go from 0 to 1 minus s because that's, I, have, I have to, you know, it's a triangle now, right? And then I go from 0 to 1 for s. Okay, there's a question in the back, I believe. Q, Q bold, sorry, this Q here's the internal heat generation is, is, is what you apply to the system. You know, it's internal heat generation. It's, it's, it will be given to you, the value. It, it could, it, um, I guess it can, but, but it's no different from the other things we've done where uh, you can represent that Q in terms of the the um, natural shape function or natural coordinate system. It won't be very hard to do, to represent it there. Okay. Uh, it's a change in variables, remember that. This is a change in variables. Um, what else we got? You know, it's all the same. All the same. B bold is J inverse B bold N. The only thing that we're changing is this uh, integral. Okay, which is the, how you integrate a triangle. I mean, you can look it up in any book, but that's how you integrate a triangle. Okay. Um, other than that, we're again left with this term, which will be dealt with the same manner I described the quadrilateral, and I'll explain how to deal with this with a real example moving forward, because I think it's a repetitive thing at this point. Um, you guys did the calculation with me. B ball n is minus one one zero minus one zero one. Same logic applies. This B and ball is that. X Y is a pair of coordinates. So with that, I get J bold. Um, this is uh, a pair of three of them. There's three vertices, and then B ball n is, is is well known. Two by three. So I get a J J ball is two by two. I know the conductivity, and I'm ready to to celebrate now with how to do Gaussian quadrature for a triangle. Okay, this Gaussian quadrature for a triangle only works uh, for these integrals uh, zero to one minus s zero to one. Uh, the rules look a little bit strange, but they work. Uh, so uh, what you do, you you take this g value, whatever's inside this integral. And uh, that's what, in, what you need to evaluate, okay? You have to multiply that by the Gauss weight and then sum everything up and then divide it by two. Don't forget this one half. That comes from the, the, uh, the way they derive these rules. If you're interested in how they derive these rules, I can point you to some references. I, I don't think it's valuable of our time to discuss how those were derived. We can just trust the mathematicians there. Uh, but it does work, and I've used it. Uh, for linear, uh, quadratic and cubic, for linear, you can use one point. And then uh, the weight functions, the Gauss weight is one. And then the locations at where you need to evaluate G will be at, uh, at the centroid, one third, one third. So you will evaluate right there in the centroid. Uh, but you don't need to know that's at the centroid. You just need to know that you're evaluating this at one third, one third. Okay? Uh, I don't want to bore you, but the quadratic and cubic, uh, same thing. You know, you have the, the, the first values represent the weights that go along with the pairs that need to be evaluated for R and S. Okay. Any questions? There's another, another way to evaluate this, and, and those use the, they get closer to the edges, uh, but uh, the values are different from the ones in the page before. Uh, they, they still work very well, okay? I put the same one for the single point, uh, so you, you, just as a reference point, so you can see that, that, that one doesn't change. The other ones do change. Uh, for example, the second one is evaluated at the edges. Um, 
while the previous one didn't, it was evaluated in, in, in a little bit in, in the interior. Uh, they both work very well. Uh, I don't have a preference. Uh, any questions so far? Uh, for for a linear triangular element, just use one point. Yeah, uh, it's a constant triangular element. Let's think. Let's let's see. Let's look at this. For a triangular element, you agree that this does not depend on R and S? Huh? No. Look at J bold. Does J bold depend on R and S? B bold n is all numbers. X bold and Y bold is all numbers, the coordinates of the triangle. So there's nothing here. From here to here, there's nothing that really depends on R and S. So all of that, you can evaluate that this almost analytically. You can take all that out, this integral, and you get double integral of DRDS, which is basically the area of the triangle, which is 1 half. Base times height is the area times one half. So for linear, linear triangle, uh, it's called a constant, constant uh, strain triangle because, well, in solid mechanics, in heat transfer is basically a constant gradient triangle because the gradient is constant across that triangle. It doesn't change. You you can see that here. B bull gave you constant. Is the equation also linear triangle? Sorry. No, this works for quadratic, uh, for cubic, you know. Okay. All right, let's go to second order uh, triangular elements. Second order, uh, uh, Leonardo, curved sides go straight to a triangular element like this. It works. Just telling you. I can't believe it, but it works. Somebody had a question on this, Leonardo? Can, can you remind me? What the question was? Uh, somebody had a question on this. <laughs> and is it answered? Yeah, I, I was asking you if the line Jacobian works from curved edges to. Okay, there you go. It works. All right. It works. You use it all the time for your fitted radius, don't you? It works. Uh, the derivation of the shape functions follows the same process. Uh, you can quickly, actually, this is another one you can do by hand really quick. I kind of gave you the process here. These ones are uh, about a midpoint, one half. This is about midpoint, one half. This is about one half, one half. And then using that, you can calculate um, the shape functions fairly quickly. It doesn't take long to do. Uh, I mean, there are more of them now. There are six, of course, there are six nodes now, so more work to do, but. The computer does it for you now, at this point. Um, then the same process. I, I'm, I'm going to skip all the steps because now I can go to, to, to the final, you know, to the final form of everything. The, the, it's a triangle, so I go from 0 to 1 minus s, 0 to 1. Everything else is, and then now you have v bold n, which is like six terms now, right? Jacobian. You know, now I didn't calculate the derivatives here because, you know, I could probably do it. It's not that hard. That's it for a triangle. High order element. Okay. Let's do a second order, high order quadrilateral element now. Because we did a linear quadrilateral, didn't we? Let's do a second order. For second order, uh, there's an eight noted. We call this serendipity element. Serendipity element. Uh, one, two, three, four. Mean nodes are at five, six, seven, eight. I can take any quadrilateral that has a shape, curved edges. It'll go down to square very nicely, behave minus one to one, minus one to one. Um, I have how many terms I have? How many unknown coefficients? Three? Eight, eight. One, two, three, eight. Okay. <laughs> uh, 
All right, off the record. <laughs> um, so if I have eight, now I have to choose what kind of terms I need. I go to Pascal triangle to, to inform that information. So I have one, two, three, four, five, six. Now I have to decide. Well, seven and eight. Just go with the middle ones. That makes the most sense. So use eight terms. Uh, I instead of writing them up, I just borrow them from a book. But there you go. And it's also in an abacus. Abacus manual also has them. Uh, they're the same. And abacus manual has them in the theory manual section. They give you the shape functions they're using. It's no different from this. Um, there you go. I'll cover that. Uh, nine node quadrilateral element, so I can also have a quadrilateral element and put a middle node there, uh, a middle node. This is called a bubble function. So this, the function that goes with this node is called bubble function. Uh, the reason it's called bubble function is because the shape function, um, if that node is active, is going to cause like a bubble, right? So it's going to it's going to push. If I fix this and I apply a load to the center of that node, it's going to cause a shape of a bubble. It's called bubble function. Um, this element is superior in many ways to the Q8 element. This is a Q9 element. Uh, the way you select the shape function for that, you kind of go and add this extra term here. I can't add that one because I'll be biased. I can't add that one, so then add that one. Derive the shape function the same way as discussed before. Uh, well, actually, I, I want to show you that you can actually derive the shape functions by taking products of the 1D shape functions. For Remember for uh, quadratic elements, right? Everybody's here? For quadratic elements, we have three shape functions. I can take products of this and get all nine of them really quick. And, and that's what you see here. I can, I can get all of them really quick. Um, but... Uh, uh, the bottom one is known as a bubble function. And then uh, the next one shows you another form of writing the same functions. Uh, th they look different, but they give you the they're the same. Um, finally, uh, the element formulation, that's, that's an error if you can uh, take a note, but I shouldn't have written 4 by 4. It's an 8 noted, 9 noted, so it's going to be 8 by 8, you know, eight equations, or nine by nine, nine equations. Sorry about that. But uh, I lost my energy, so I just put three dots. <laughs> OK, there's eight shape functions, so you should have eight terms there, or nine, depending upon which one you're looking at, OK? Excellent. Let's compare the Q9 element to the Q8 element. Uh, isoparametric uh, uh, elements lose accuracy, so they do lose accuracy when you're going to a highly distorted element to a square element. Uh, but uh, the Q9 does have some advantages over the Q8 element. Uh, Q9 is less sensitive to that issue that I just discussed. Uh, it handles the curved edges much better. It handles the nodes being away from the mid nodes, mid, the edges, mid sides better. Uh, it, it bending is improved relative to the Q8. Uh, remember mass lumping in uh, dynamic problems? Uh, Q8 elements will give you uh, some negative nodal masses. Uh, with Q9, uh, all the you get basically get a lump mass that's positive, and that's actually advantageous for stability. Um, so uh, to uh, take the question on the floor here. Uh, triangular elements, so a linear triangle, and I'll cover this in more extensive detail a little bit later before the course ends, I promise. Uh, the triangular elements, linear, uh, linear triangular elements are, are less accurate um, than, of course, higher order elements uh, for the reasons that they, they cannot represent a gradient of temperature across an element. They, they can only represent a constant gradient. Uh, when you go and I compare a triangular element, the second order, higher order, uh, to a quadrilateral element, uh, I think the, the triangular element with second order wins. Uh, the quadrilateral element is still 
the linear one is still not as good. But now when you go second order on the quadrilateral, now that becomes even better. At that point, both start to behave almost the same rate of convergence, I will say. So I, I will discuss this more, but I wanted to take a question at least now. But later on, we'll discuss this when we cover error and convergence. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll say a few things. Uh, Example problem. Let's go for the example problem. The example problem here that I'm going to describe is a chimney problem. Um, I took this from a book uh, here. That's the book, uh, the name of the book. I was trying to find a good problem that's easy to do in class, relatively quick to do, that will not take me too long to do either. Um, and so here you have a chimney. There's hot gases coming from the center. Uh, the outside of that chimney is at a, a room temperature, so outside temperature. Um, the convection coefficient of the outside temperature is that of air, so natural air, in a non-windy day. If the air, if that day was windy, then the convection coefficient goes up, and then uh, things will become colder. Um, the chimney is a hot temperature. The conductivity of this material is selected to be close to concrete to make it as, as realistic as possible. Uh, I give you all the parameters here. Uh, K for conductivity. Uh, the temperature of the hot gases is 300 C. The outside, and I give you the, the, the convection coefficient for the, for the uh, hot gas. And then we have the temperatures uh, from the environments, which are 20. That's basically about 70 degrees F. And then you have uh, the air coefficient, the convection of air natural air in a, in a not, not very windy day, <clears throat> 21. <coughs> and so uh, for the purpose of simplifying this problem, we can actually use symmetry. So uh, I'll cut the model into this piece here. That piece is repetitive everywhere. You can see that. So why not just model that? And so that's what you see here. We're going to model that little section. Um, in this edge and this edge, we're going to assume no heat losses. So that's an adiabatic boundary condition, no Q in that edge. That makes sense. Um, so now we're ready to work the problem. Uh, we'll discretize the domain into three square elements, uh, two triangular elements, because that's the shape that you see here. So I was trying to get that shape as, as the best I could. Uh, for element one, element two, three, four and five, uh, I'll write down the, con uh, the connectivity, connectivity, nodal connectivity. For element one, I'm going to have one, two, six, five. Okay. For element two, I'm going to have two, three, seven, six. For element three, three, four, seven. But I could have done four, seven, three, and I could have done, uh, you know, it doesn't matter. The important thing is that you keep track of this somewhere. Element four, five, six, nine, eight. Five six nine eight. I could have done six nine eight five or nine eight five six. Doesn't matter, but I just did it consistently, and I had a purpose for that. Is because I didn't want to do a lot of work. Otherwise, you have to redo everything, and I didn't want to spend too much time on this. Uh, triangular element here for element five six seven nine, and the nodal information for every node, node one zero zero, and then you can calculate the node locations across here with the dimensions given in the problem statement, which I'll, I don't want to discuss. So you can quickly come up with the nodal dimensions. Isn't this what advocacy requires from you? Right? You have to get the nodal information, the element information, the connectivity, and then you execute. We're ready to begin. Uh, for element one, uh, I have no, I'm not doing transient. 
So let's throw that term away. Um, I don't have internal heat generation in the concrete, so I'm not putting like a Q internal to the concrete. So, so that's zero. Uh, so I'm left with the, the capacitance matrix, and then I'm left with uh, the, the boundary conditions. The, what, what I'm applying heat to the boundaries, okay? To two of the boundaries only. I'm only applying, uh, I'm, I'm losing heat here in this boundary, and I'm, I'm basically inputting heat here at this boundary. Right, because that's the one inside the chimney. This one is outside the chimney. That's, you're losing heat there. You're entering heat there. And so that's basically Qn equals heat transfer coefficient T minus T of the uh, hot gas. And then here is H, H uh, heat transfer coefficient of the air T, which is the temperature of this boundary here, uh, minus the temperature of the air. Okay. Uh, with that said, we're ready to get B, B and bold. I already know what B and bold is for uh, element number one. I'm looking at element number one, which has, is this one right here. Uh, so doing that, and then look at this so, so quickly here. B and bold is this one here, right? And the non number one had this coordinates. Non number two had that coordinate. Non number three had that coordinate. Non number four has that coordinate. Bam, done. Multiply this by that. When you do that, Magic happens. Uh, there's nothing that, that, that is a function of C and eta. The reason for that is because I chose a square. And in a natural coordinate system, it's a square. That's one. So it's just scaling. It's scaling this, the square from a 2 by 2 to a what 0.05 by 0.05 element. Okay. Any questions on that? Of course, I'm going to choose something simple for me. More complicated for you. Okay. J inverse, that's easy. I actually did it by looking at it. So that's 40 and 40. Determinant J, that's also easy to calculate. So that, that times that minus that times that. Bam, done. Okay, what else we got? Um, we have element one. That's what I got. Uh, don't forget the connectivity for element one, one, two, six, five, one, two, six, five. Write it down. Don't forget it. Let's go to element two. Element two, uh, don't want to bore you with that, but B and bold is the same thing. Oh, by the way, I, I don't know if I said this, but this was the connectivity, the K value for the concrete. Um, what else we got? Uh, oh, yeah, this coordinate is changed for that element. That's all. That's the only thing that changes. Shape functions are the same for every single element, right? Multiply these two things together, get the Jacobian. Uh, the Jacobian happens to be the same, uh, but that makes sense because the element looks the same, okay? And then don't forget the connectivity, 2, 3, 7, 6, 2, 3, 7, 6. Write it down, don't forget it. Question so far? Simple? Element 4, element 4... Don't want to bore you, but that's, I'm basically covering all the elements that are square. I'm covering all these elements here. One, two, four. Uh, so let's keep four because it's the same thing, same process, okay? But don't forget the connectivity, of course. So go to element three, which is a triangle now. So let's pay attention to this one. Triangle, the integral goes from zero to one minus s, zero to one. B and bold, we already did that by even memory. Like we just did it here, right, really quick. I know the, the coordinates for that triangle, 0 0.10, 0 0.15, 0, 0 0.1, 0 0.05. Multiply these two things together, get Jacobian, and it's 0 0.05, 0, 0, 0 0.05. And uh, J inverse is 20, 0, 0, 20, and then determine the J is 0 0.025, okay? Um, yeah, any questions on that? Follow it so far? And then don't forget the connectivity, 3, 4, 7, 3, 4, 7, okay? Uh, element 5, uh, same process. So element 5, don't forget the number, 6, 7, 9, 6, 7, 9, but same process. Now let's hit the hard part. The hard part is the loads because the loads are heat fluxes and they're applied at the edges. 
So we need to understand how to tackle that. But before we do that, we need to assemble this, the capaci capacitance matrix. Uh, so assembly is a 9 by 9, so 1 through 9, 1 through 9. Right, there's nine nodes, nine unknowns. Um, I'm ready now to cover now the, the, the heat fluxes now. So let's cover for element four. Element four has a heat flux applied at this edge, you agree? But no heat flux applied here, no heat flux applied here, no heat flux applied here. So the only place we have it is at that edge. If you look at the connectivity, the connectivity was one, two, sorry, one, two, Three, four. Three, four. So three, four is the edge where I'm really applying the heat flux. You agree? Yeah? And so the edge eight, nine here is really edge three, four. And so that's the one I'm working on. So that maps out in the uh, um, natural coordinate system as three, four at this edge. Okay? Now, how do I know I'm at that edge? How do I know? Because eta is 1 at this edge. And so the only thing varying is a differential element deep C along that, right? So, so I need to tackle that carefully. Uh, and so my integral now in, the, in this coordinate system is, is basically n bold transpose. That hasn't changed. Q is my heat flux. The heat flux is h in times t minus t in that's the formula that goes there. And h here, don't confuse that, that's the plate thickness. It's one as defined by the problem. It's just one meters, OK? Which is quite actually accurate. Chimneys are typically at the top end that's uh, protruding the house is about you know three feet. So that's not too bad assumption. Um, so let's tackle this guy, because this guy is evaluated at eta equals one, remember. We're at this height here. That's the edge of interest right there. Um, I go to that one, and uh, I want to show you how things look, because it's, it's, it doesn't look that simple, but it is simple um, now that you understand it. So this was in the global coordinate system, in, in, the, in the coordinate system, the quadrilateral. I'm turning this ds into, um, I'm sorry. Yeah, this was from the previous slide. Uh, that was a Q heat flux, which is H times T minus T infinity, or, or, or the temperature of the air, or sorry, the chimney, the hot gas. So, so then I have N transpose bold, which is these shape functions for quadrilateral, right? Yeah? And then this H in is that one. Do you agree that T is basically N bold, T bold? Yeah? Minus T I N is known. We know this value. That was given by the problem, 300 C Celsius. And I'll turn this DS into a square root, uh, derivative of X root of C squared plus derivative of Y root of C squared at eta equals 1, because that's the edge I'm at, deep C. And when I evaluate all these at eta equals 1, what I get actually is the distance between the two nodes, 3 and 4. So between these two nodes for that element. Um, and then I have um, this guy, C equals one, eta equals 1, that's 0. That's 0, right? So then I get 1 plus C divided by 2 and 1 minus C divided by 2. You agree? Doesn't that make sense? Let's think about it. Let's think about that. So let, let me go back to that problem so you can see what has happened. Node 1 and node 2, so if you look here, these ones here are not active when you're applying heat flux here. So it makes sense that node 1 and node 2 are not contributing to the heat flux, to the, to the heat flux and that's why they came out to be 0. Okay? And then you guys can do a check uh, at home, but if you take this shape function here, and multiply by t bold, you will get these equations here. I don't want to show you those steps. You can check at home. And then I went to Mathematica and integrated this really quick. It actually took me like about 25 seconds, um, if I remember correctly. And, and I got, I got the, the, the consistent load vector for element 4. 
And I have to be careful because these temperatures that we're talking about here are at element four, node th three and four, right? So I converted that to global node uh, here, which is nine and eight. And you guys can check that at home. Then I repeated that for element one. And for element one, everything is given here. You guys can check it at home. Element two, I repeated the process because there's, now I'm talking about these ones here, this edge here. So there's like three of them I have to do. Uh, so here what I do, I do it for every single one of them. And then I do it for a triangle. For a triangle, it's a little bit tricky as well. Um, my advice, and I think most girls work that way, is that choose the element connectivity in such a manner that you never map the heat flux into this edge here because you're going to have difficulty. So try to choose the element connectivity so that, and most codes do it that way, they try to keep uh, basically one, edge one and two and uh, edge um, one and three, they try to uh, keep the connectivity so that the heat flux is applied only at those edges. That way, when you map it, you're mapping either here or the here. And that makes the calculation issue. The minute you map it here, it's, it's tough to, to calculate it, OK? Um, I know I'll go through all the steps, but the bottom line is that your value is at s equals minus 1 because I'm here uh, at this. Actually, that's wrong. I'm at s equals 0. That, that's an error, s equals 0, because I'm here at this edge. And that's s equals 0, OK? Um, but here I have it correct, so that's s equals 0. You guys can check this at home. OK, shape functions, and then when you evaluate them, uh, you'll have a good time doing that. You get um, this is a connectivity. Keep that connectivity in mind. And then for element 5, element 5 is the only one that's not exposed to any heat. None of the edges is expo exposed to any heat, and you can check it, because that's, that's this element here. There's no heat applied here. This Heat, you're not applying any heat here, no heat here. So then, I'm almost done. I'm sorry I'm going a little bit ahead. But I'm almost done, really done, really quick. Uh, I have K, right? I have K. I have Q now. And now I have a bunch of temperatures. So I have to bring those to the other side. And you guys know how to do that now. They have to rearrange it. And once I do that, I can solve for the temperatures. And that's what I get uh, for the problem. And that's what Abacus gives me. Uh, as well. You can see, you can see that this compares exactly what I got. Well, not exactly, but really close, like 97.1, 96.32. 232, 232, or 37, sorry. I'm trying to be cocky here. <laughs> <laughs> Five degrees off is not too bad, and uh, especially I rounded a lot of things to keep, to, to type things fast. I didn't write a code like you did. I kind of manually assembled it. Um, here you can see uh, the, the temperature distribution across the elements. Um, makes sense. It should be hot here, cooler here at this edge, because that's the outside temperature. Um, really good within, within 1%, 5%. 5%. more like 1%, but you guys can check it at home. Uh, well, how to put it together by hand, really easy. Uh, that's a nodal information. Just co I actually took copy paste from that table and pasted it here and put columns. Replace the element connectivity same. The table is the same table I used here, uh, but for the triangular elements is a DC two D three, and for quadrilateral is a DC two D four. The material thickness is one because it's one meter, um, and then uh, the material material I said aluminum is not really aluminum it's concrete. I'm sorry about that, uh, but the connectivity is one point four. Uh, density and specific heat, you can put whatever value you want here because it's not going to matter for this problem. This problem is not transient, so that part of the problem is not going to come into play. Uh, and then I created a set, element set for the outside chimney, this, that surface. Uh, so those elements are, uh, in the, in, like outside, uh, being exposed by air. And I created an element set for the element that's adjacent to the hot gas, which is just one of them. It's just element four. Uh, so just uh, pictorially, uh, what I'm talking about is these three elements are the ones exposed to that air, and then this element is the only one exposed to hot gases. I'm almost done. I'm sorry. Just two more minutes. Really done. 
they now have to create the surface, right? So this is what Abacus is doing. It's actually using the same information that I was using. I need to know what surface I'm applying the heat flux, right? Well, you have to tell it. Abacus cannot um, miraculously say what's going on. So, so that's the one step you have to define. So inside chimney, that surface, that's edge number three, right? That's edge number three. And for all those elements, is edge number three. Um, we know that um, that makes sense. It's only one element. If you remember the nodal, uh, the way I created the connect connectivity was one, two, three, four. So edge one, two, three. That's the edge that I need to be applying the heat flux. That's how I know it's S3. For the bottom ones that I'm going to discuss next, I numbered it one, two, three, four. So therefore, it's edge one for all of them. So I call it surface number one. Uh, that's how you tell Abacus, hey, it's surface one that you're really exposing this uh, air to. Then, S3 is edge three of the element that's exposed to the hot air. So if I number the connectivity is one, two, three, four, right? So that's edge one, two, and then three. Yeah. Edge three is the one exposed. Uh, three. Yeah. Number three. Number three. Edge three. Not the element, but the edge is exposed. Uh, then the step, I apply a heat transfer steady state solution. I use a, something called a film to be able to do heat transfer uh, uh, with, uh, with air or with a hot gas. Uh, here, what you can do is say uh, the inside, so I call the surface inside. That's the name of the surface. It's called inside. Uh, then comma F is an element type level. So if you make it FNU, then you can write a user subroutine to make a, a code that perhaps varies the, the, the temperature outside as a function of, of, of location. But here is just F uh, for film coefficient. Then 300 is the temperature of the chimney, of, of the hot gas, I'm sorry. 70 is the, is the heat transfer coefficient. And then again, I have an S film for outside uh, and then uh, comma F, comma 20, which is the temperature of the uh, cool air. And then 21 is a heat transfer coefficient, okay? So with that, I have concluded uh, the topic of isoparametric elements as applied to heat transfer problems. Thank you very much for, for attending. Uh, you have a great weekend.